I will ask to start our first session here. And I'm going to ask uh, John Simon Bolton then from the Francis Crick to uh, kind of from can you share your screen now? And Simon's going to talk about um, homologous recombination at a single molecular level. This is my disclosure side. So a very nice uh, segue from Jonathan and the importance of industry and translation. So I'm actually a founder of, of Arteus Pharma Limited, which is based just outside of Cambridge. And we're making DNA repair inhibitors for cancer treatment. And we have two uh, inhibitors now in clinical trials. Actually, we just announced yesterday our uh, pulp beta inhibitor dosed its first patient, uh, which is a major milestone. I'm not going to tell you about the work that we do at Arteus. This is really the work uh, exclusively of my academic lab at the Crick, uh, and is a long-term collaboration with David Weeder's group at Imperial, who's, who's here and one of the organizers. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here and kicking off the meeting. So I'm going to tell you about how we've set up single molecule approaches to study homologous recombination. Um, so actually for, I think it's nearly 30 years, I've been working on double strand break repair, starting with uh, my PhD in Steve Jackson's lab, studying non-homologous on joining, which I'll introduce briefly. Double strand breaks, of course, are, are, are very important physiologically for generating the antibody repertoire, BDJ recombination, class switch recombination, et cetera, and also for generating gametes for sexual re reproduction through meiotic recombination. But one of the interests we've had for a number of years is, is the problems that double strand breaks pose to genome stability. And of course, we, uh, it is abundantly clear from spectric karyotyping, as you can see here, that complex structural variations, translocations, deletions, and uh, copy number changes are largely driven through mist or error prone repair of double strand breaks. So understanding the cause and consequences and also how we can exploit double strand break repair deficiencies uh, is, is something that is very active in this area. So simplistically speaking, there are two major double strand break repair pathways in cells. Uh, the, the simplest one, which I mentioned previously, which I worked on as a graduate student, is called non-homologous end joining. Um, it is a, the simplest mechanism because essentially what it does is it brings break uh, ends together and simply re-ligates them. Sometimes you need to process the ends, so that can lead to loss of genetic information. And because the process is occurring independent of DNA sequence, double strand breaks from different parts of the genome can be ligated together. And as a consequence, that can drive translocations and other rearrangements as well. And, and, and as a, uh, you can therefore describe end joining as intrinsically error prone. The situation, of course, changes as you proceed through the cell cycle. So in SG2, once the genome has been duplicated, then an alternative re repair mechanism, which is largely error-free, can, uh, can act on double strand breaks. And that process is called homologous recombination, or HR for short. In order for recombination to occur, you need an intact sister chromatid as a template, hence the need for replication. Uh, and to, to really trigger the recombination process, you need to process the ends of the double strand break to produce three prime overhangs. And this occurs by a process called double strand break resection. Uh, this creates the substrate onto which um, uh, recombination proteins, and I will introduce those in the next slide, uh, load onto this substrate, onto this single-stranded DNA. And they then possess the ability to identify homologous sequence in the uh, intact sister chromatid and catalyze a strand transfer reaction, invasion of the broken DNA molecule, pairing with the complementary strand and displacement of the non-complementary strand, essentially to set up a replication bubble that can be primed to initiate DNA synthesis, copy the missing information, and then using various different methods, you can essentially resolve this or repair it in different ways to give rise to largely error-free repair of the double strand break. So lo a lot of what we know about recombination stems from work in prokaryotes, uh, sort of highlighting um, uh, the point that was made uh, earlier about the importance of fundamental research. So the, the archetypal recombinase is RECA in prokaryotes, and uh, what it can do is it can load onto single or double-stranded DNA uh, to form these nuclear protein filaments. And you can see this very nice uh, negative stain EM image of RECA bound to single-stranded DNA. We also have a lot of structural information uh, on how this filament forms. For example, work from Phoebe Rice and Nikola Pavlovich has been pioneering in this area. So it was really the work of Steve Kolosikoski at UC Davis that really provided insight into how RAF15 RECA can actually accumulate as a filament. 
And this was using single molecule approaches. And this was a study by Bell and colleagues in Nature in 2012. And what you can see is basically um, RECA binding to a single strand gap, it nucleates and then begins to grow bidirectionally uh, to form this nuclear protein filament. So this was great, but uh, it turns out that subsequent studies from Andrea Candeli and work from my lab has shown that in fact, the eukaryotic counterpart of, Re uh, of RECA, which is called RAF51, cannot do this. It's very, very inefficient at nucleating and loading uh, and forming that nuclear protein filament. So it was not clear how the eukaryotic proteins were actually working to, to form these filaments in vivo. So this is the situation in, in, in eukaryotes. So RAF51 is the eukaryotic counterpart of RAC A. Um, and what we now know is that in fact, RAF51 is an inefficient enzyme. And this really points to the need for regulation. And it's in fact regulated by a number of really key proteins implicated in human disease. Many of you will be aware of the BRCA genes. These are the two breast and ovarian cancer tumor suppressor genes that are commonly mutated in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And uh, it's become increasingly apparent that they're also uh, inactivated either through epigenetic modifications or somatic mutations in, in many other cancers as well. So BRCA1, in fact, is, is important for processing or at least promoting the processing of the double strand break end uh, during resection, whereas BRCA2, in fact, is a direct regulator of RAF51. It binds to it through various repeated sequences in the BRC, BRCA2 protein. Uh, it helps to deliver RAF51 into the nucleus. And then when a double strand break occurs, uh, BRCA2 is important for uh, depositing um, RAF51 uh, at double strand break sites. So it, it's promoting the initial nucleation. And this is supported by a lot of bulk biochemistry. And as I'll show you, we now have evidence that this is true at a single molecule level as well. One of the other factors that you're probably less well known, they're called the RAF51 paralogs. They are in fact relatives of, of RAF51, um, uh, obviously evolved from a common ancestor. Now these are probably, uh, you could call them the BRCA3s. So there are well-documented mutations in the RAF51 paralogs that are causal for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And again, you see somatic mutations in cancer. Now, these were identified using genetics over 40 years ago, but their role in recombination was not clear. Uh, in fact, it's only the work that we've done now in, in the last few years using our single molecule approaches that we've really gained insight into the mechanism of action of this important uh, complex uh, in this process, and I'm going to show you uh, how we got to that uh, insight. So what is true for, for these three proteins, BRCA1, BRCA2, and RAF51 uh, paralogs, in this case RAF51C, is if you mutate them, you fail to accumulate RAF51 at double strand break. So I'm showing you immunofluorescence uh, of RAF51 after treatment with ionizing radiation. You can see this focal accumulation, this punctate pattern, of RAF51, which is corresponding to RAF51 nucleating and forming filaments at double strand break sites in cells. This is clearly compromised in the absence of any of these other mediator proteins. So they certainly fit the bill as factors that may facilitate RAF51 in doing its job. So unfortunately, the human system is very complex, right? Um, and this is, this is highlighted by the fact that the human BRCA2 protein is 3,418 amino acids. So we've actually pioneered the use of C. elegans over the last 20 years. It's a simple system. Obviously, you can use the genetics as we have done. But actually, the biochemistry and single molecule approaches have, uh, uh, have been surprisingly uh, productive because the protein complexes, although they perform the same function as their human counterparts, they're much more simple. So for example, hum uh, C. elegans BRCA2 is 400 amino acids, much more uh, amenable to biochemical and single molecule studies, yet it performs pretty much the same uh, role in cells as its human counterpart. So we've used this system uh, to really interrogate the mechanism of action of recombination. So the system we've been using, and this, is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a, a close collaboration with David Weider's group at Imperial. Uh, we've used a, a Lumix C trap. So this is a, an optical trapping microscope. It has um, a confocal uh, free color fluorescence microscopy and a fly, five channel uh, microfluidics device. So what essentially what we do is we use, um, uh, we capture polystyrene bees using lasers. We transfer them into a second channel that's containing, in this case, double-stranded lambda DNA. We capture the, the lambda DNA uh, on each end. Uh, we can then move this into a, a, a third channel uh, and induced uh, a melting of the double-stranded DNA to produce single-stranded DNA 
by forced induced melting. Uh, in this particular experiment, we're actually including RPA, the single strand uh, binding protein, uh, in this case fused to EGFP, so we can actually visualize the single stranded DNA and when it's formed. Now, this is important because physiologically in vivo, RPA is in fact a, an antagonist of Rafferty-1. One of the things that Rafferty-1 needs to overcome is RPA bound to the single stranded DNA that's produced during that initial resection of the break. So the challenge is for Rafferty-1 to displace RPA to allow it to assemble uh, first as a nuclei and then to grow as a filament. So that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to use using RPA as a pro, uh, displacement as a proxy for Rafferty-1 filament uh, nucleation and growth. So this is the setup. So you see on the, uh, the left-hand side is the position on lambda, and then uh, you can see this is over time. So these are chymographs, essentially looking at the displacement of RPA as Rafferty-1 filaments grow. So in this experiment, we've just included the single proteins in isolation. So in this case, we're using an excess of RAP51 at 500 nanomolar, which is a lot, right? But you can see that there's very little displacement of RPA. There are a few events that you can see marked with these arrows where you can see very small filaments are beginning to form. But largely on its own, RAP51 cannot um, form these filaments and it can't displace RPA. And BRCA2 or the paralogs alone have no effect. So what was really striking is when we start to include the uh, mediator proteins, BRCA2 and the paralogs in conjunction with RAF51. And when you do this, you get this beautiful um, uh, displacement of, of RPA over time as those filaments nucleate and grow. So you can see BRCA2 has a really strong effect, but what was really striking to us was what happens when we're adding the paralogs. I mean, this is adding at substoichiometric concentrations. We've got RAF51 at 500 nanomolar, the paralogs at 25 nanomolar. And that was a, a bit of a surprise, but you'll see why it's substoichiometric a bit later on. So you can see this very nice displacement, really significant for the paralogs. And you can see this quantified here where we're looking at the uh, decline in fluorescence intensity of RPA over time. And you can see that the paralogs, which are in red, lead to a very rapid displacement of, of RPA. So is this truly a filament, right? So I'm going to show you why we think it is. Under this, exactly the same reaction conditions, I'm showing you negative sustain EM. So hopefully you can see this, but I've marked the filaments that are growing uh, using little uh, yellow asterisks. You can see these here. So by negative stain EM, this is done by with Rado and Enchef at the Crick, you can see that with the paralog, we start to see these uh, nu uh, nucleating filaments growing by negative stain EM under the same conditions as a single molecule approach. And we also know that when a filament uh, begins to grow, it actually increases the contour length of DNA by one and a half. As a consequence, you see a force decrease as the filament grows. And again, what you can see with increasing concentrations of the Raphael paralog in purple, 10 nanomolar, red, 25 nanomolar, the paralog, you can see a rapid decline in force as the, the filament grows. And that's because the contour length of the DNA increases uh, when the beads are held at a constant force. So we think that based on these criteria, what we're seeing with this RPA displacement is bona fide filament formation. So we've also combined BRCA2 and the paralogs together, and we see a synergistic enhancement uh, of filament growth. The reason being is, in fact, what's happening here, and, and I don't have time to go into this, we, we provided detail in the paper we published earlier in the year, is that BRCA2 initially nucleates, it allows those initial nucleation events of RAF-D1 on single-stranded DNA, overcoming RPA, and then the paralogs come in and allow the, the filament to grow. And I'll show you some evidence for that in the next slide. So what we can do is we can actually measure the trajectories of the growing filaments, as you can see here. Now, when we actually measure this at different concentrations, you can see that BRCA2 has a, a very modest effect on growth rate. However, the paralogs you can see with increasing concentrations lead to a significant increase in growth, growth stimulation. So this really highlights the difference between the paralogs and BRCA2. BRCA2 does that in nucleation event, the paralogs then stimulate filament growth. So it's this two-step mechanism. Essentially what rec does on its own but the, the eukaryotic RAF51 needs that initial nucleation and then stimulation of growth for you to form a robust filament. So one thing that we didn't know from those experiments is the polarity of growth. I told you that RAC actually grows bidirectionally. We wanted to know whether or not this was true for the eukaryotic homolog. So what we've generated are sort of bespoke uh, substrates uh, 
whereby using Cas9 NIC cases, the NIC at defined positions, we're using two in each cases, we can generate asymmetric single strand DNA gaps with a defined position. And because they're asymmetric, we know their polarity, right? And because we know where they are within lambda DNA. And so this is just two representative examples where we've uh, used the Cas9 NIC case, we apply force, the gap pops out, and you can then stain that with cytox origin, uh, orange for the, the double-stranded DNA and RPA GFP to stain the gap. If you're interested in this, we can make gaps for a, a whole range of different science, uh, sizes. This was a paper that David and I published uh, recently in Star Protocols defining how exactly you do this. I think this is really nice new techniques for, for this kind of uh, single molecule uh, approaches. So we then use these gaps to then, with a defined polarity, to look at the, um, the polarity of filament nucleation and growth. And to cut a long story short, the paralogs actually promote the, uh, the nucleation and growth of the uh, RAV21 filament in a three to five prime direction. We never see it uh, being stimulated in the other direction. And this was really interesting because we'd shown in two uh, previous papers we published back in 2015 and 16, that actually the paralog preferentially binds to the five prime end of the filament. So this again potentially explains why the paralogs act substoichiometrically because they only act at one end, right? So the way we've done this is we've labeled the RAV21 paralog with a flag tag and then using an M2 flag uh, antibody coupled to 20 nanometer gold particles, we can immu do, conduct immunogold DM studies. So you can see this very nice striated uh, RAV21 filament and you can see the paralog bound at one end, okay? And this is the quantification. This is over six, uh, approaching 600 um, filaments analyzed. The vast majority have a single um, um, paralog at one end. We never see it at both. And we've, we very, very rarely see uh, lateral associations with the filaments. We think it's an end binding activity that's important here. Okay. Um, I should say that we know it's the five prime end because we've used uh, fluorophores at the five and the three prime end. We only see protein induced fluorescent enhancement when the paralogs added with a fluorophore at the five prime end, which is how we know it's the five prime. We've also seen five prime end filament engagement using the single molecule approach. So this is now a parallel complex that's labeled with Alexa 647. So we can now do co-staining of RPA displacement uh, whereby filament nucleation. And you can see the paralog engaging, in fact, with the edge of the growing filament, consistent with the end binding. So um, with David, we've developed various algorithms to look at positional information. And you can see this is the filament here uh, with RPA displacement as the filament grows. And the paralog is right on the boundary of the growing filament, consistent with it being at the, the end. And again, because we can do this using the asymmetric gaps, we know that this is the five prime end of the filament. So by various different criteria, we're confident that the paralog binds to one end of the filament. Okay. So how does the paralog actually promote growth? So we've done a dipping experiment here where we've looked at the stability of RAV51 when bound to DNA. So they were just looking at initial nucleation and how, it, how long it lasts. So essentially looking at dwell times. So you have the position of genomic D, uh, uh, on lambda DNA here, and then you can see the dwell times. And what you can see immediately is that the peaks of RAV51 that occur essentially randomly in position with respect to genomic uh, DNA of lambda. So there's no sequence preference here. You can see these nuclei come up as these uh, little peaks, but they rapidly disappear. So this told us when we did the dwell time analysis, they actually last less than 30 seconds. So this says that in fact, the, st the filaments are very unstable. The situation is, is quite stark when you now add the paralog in. What you see is that the filament uh, nucleation events now become highly stabilized. So you can see now these runs over time of those initial nucleation events then stabilized by the action of the paralog. And consistent with what I just showed you about this dynamic engagement, when we use the Alexa 647 labeled parallel complex and monitor its dwell time, the paralogs come in for a very short period of time, engage with the filament end, and then dis disassemble. And this was really, I think, quite a, a surprise to us, uh, but potentially not if you think about how actin uh, filaments grow, right, with end binding factors dynamically engaging. Essentially, what we're seeing is something very, very similar uh, in this case with a growing of a RAV51 filament on DNA requiring the action of an end binding activity that's highly dynamic in its, uh, in its nature. So how is this controlled? Well, we know that the paralogs like RAV51 have rec A-like folds, they have walk array and B boxes, so therefore predicted to be ATPases. 
There was no real evidence in the literature that they are ATPases, um, uh, but nevertheless, it remained a possibility. So the first experiment we did was simply to ask what happens if we uh, inhibit ATP hydrolysis. So here we've just used ATP, right? And you can see short dwell times of the power logs on the filaments. I'm just showing the power logs in this case. However, if we add ATP gamma S, so a slowly hydrolyzing ATP analog, this significantly increases the dwell time of the power log complex on those growing filaments, suggesting that the turnover, the dynamic engagement of the power log with the end of the filament requires ATP hydrolysis. What we didn't know from this experiment, whether it was intrinsic ATP hydrolysis of the power logs or potentially ATP hydrolysis of the terminal protema of the rapidly one filament itself, right? So we showed uh, again in these two papers previously that if you make Walker box mutations in the paralog itself, these are completely defective for their ability to stimulate strand exchange uh, by rapid one So in this experiment, we're looking at a radio label single stranded DNA that's then invaded by rapid one to form a strand exchange or D-loop intermediate into a super cold plasmid with homology to the single stranded DNA. At sub-stoichiometric concentrations of, of RAF51, it has a very weak activity, but you add in increasing concentration of the power log, you switch it on, and now you see this very robust uh, strand exchange. This is completely compromised by the Walker A box mutations. So why is that? Well, it turns out that the power log wild type has this very short dwell time. And this is just a visual representation of what I've shown you. Here is a stabilized RAF51 uh, nuclei that's growing to form a filament. And you can see that the power log in red is engages with this and then it's gone. It's, it's basically in and out, it's highly dynamic. However, the mutants, the ATPase mutants, basically they stick around. So the ATP hydrolysis of the, the, of the, of the power log uh, complex is important for its release from the filament end. So what we think, as you can see here, you can see this uh, persistence of the power log in red on the filament. So turnover from the end is dependent on intrinsic ATPA's activity of the power log. So I think now we know why strand exchange is compromised. The reason is, is that they the power log mutants fail to disengage from the filament end. And this would lead to a non-productive filament that cannot do strand exchange, which is what we're seeing here. So finally, what we went on to do is we corroborated this in vivo. So we used the elegance, so we knocked in mutants of uh, the ATPase mutant, in this case, the Walker A box, the K56A and the K56R uh, K56 mutant. Uh, like the paralog null mutant, when we've got rid of the whole gene, um, the, the point mutations in the paralogs are viable, but they are sensitive to DNA damage, right? They, they, they cannot tolerate that. So that, that was interesting. But I think the most interesting part of this was when we looked at the ability to stabilize RAF51 or assemble RAF51 filaments in vivo, right? What you can see very clearly, and it's probably easiest to see this using the quantification here. So we're looking at RAF51 focus formation in the paralog null mutant after UVC damage. Same is true for camptothecan and, and, and platinum. You see that in the wild type, you induce RAF51 foci. You can see some of this here uh, on, on, on the left, but in the null mutant the paralog, as has been described in the human situation, you are severely compromised for the ability to load RAF51. So what happens with the paralog mutants? Well, the result was really beautiful. And we did this actually with um, Enrique Martinez Perez at Imperial. You can see that in fact, Rafti one actually accumulates uh, and, and it persists. Um, so it's not that the, the filaments can't form, they you form contiguous short filaments that are capped by the parallel uh, complex um, that essentially make a non-productive recombination intermediate, which is why they persist in vivo. And that fits with what we've seen biochemically. So what I've shown you is we've now uncovered the mechanism action of the raft one paralog paralogs in HR. It's taken the field 40 years, unfortunately, to work this out. But I think it really shows the power of, of direct visualization using single molecule approaches, which has really revealed how these uh, filaments uh, are growing and how they're modulated by mediated proteins. So what we found is BRCA2, consistent with bulk biochemistry, promotes the initial nucleation of, of raf one um, uh, on, on single-stranded DNA, displacing RPA. And then the paralogs then come in and act as growth stimulatory factors uh, by promoting filament growth in a three to five prime direction. Consistent with this, we see that the paralogs bind transiently uh, to five prime filament ends. So we think that they basically bind, they 
stabilize the terminal protema, and then they disengage, they bind, disengage. And in fact, if we swamp the system with uh, stoichiometric concentrations of the power log, we actually inhibit filament growth. So that, again, consistent with the idea that this is a highly dynamic uh, transient engagement. This engagement, which uh, is, is ATP hydrolysis regulated and is compromised if you make the power log mutants uh, that remain bound to the filaments, essentially making them non-productive for recombination. And we see consistent with this uh, persistence of rapidly one foci in vivo. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, just as a, a final point, that the real challenge of using the, the human system was the size, but I, I'm very pleased to report that in collaboration with my next door neighbor at, uh, at the Crick, Steve West, we've now managed to recapitulate this now with the human protein, which I think is quite heroic with BRCA2 being such a huge protein. We've made, been able to label it, show nucleation and highly dynamic filament engagement and stimulation of growth by the human power log complex. So finally, um, our paper came out earlier in the year. So if you want more details of this, uh, please see this. And I should say that this came out back to back with work from Eric Green's lab using the, the yeast Rafferty one parallel complex 5557, which is also essentially a molecular chaperone showing highly dynamic engagement with filament ends, promoting growth. Um, the way we're going now, again, long-term collaboration with David Ruida is now to look at how Rafferty one catalyzes strand invasion. We've got some very exciting preliminary data. And finally, a protein which we reported a few years ago as being important for recombination, but not really knowing how, which is HELQ. It actually has a Fanconia anemia phenotype. It's a nice segue for Laurie's talk next. Um, we've used various single molecule approaches. So this is a TERF SM FRET system and also the single molecule C trap system. We've now worked out how HELQ actually works. It does annealing to catalyze second end capture uh, to complete the repair process. So with that, um, I'll acknowledge the people who've done the work. So um, all of the paralog work I've described to you was really led by a very talented graduate student in the lab, Andre Bellin, um, the, um, with help from Matt Newton and uh, Rupesh and uh, David Weeder, I mentioned throughout, fantastic collaboration, uh, and Arthur, his postdoc, who's developed some of the scripts. Um, and Rupesh has done all the work on HELQ, and Arthur's doing the work on strand exchange. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. There we go. Thanks very much, Simon. That's a fantastic talk, just showing you the power of single molecules to be able to delineate, you know, an ordered pathway. And um, I'll pass over to my co-chair and see if there's any questions. Right. I think it's you've explained it very, very well. It looks like uh, yeah, it's, it's either that or people are, are a bit too shy if anybody has some questions. Uh, yeah, okay, we have a question um, from Zabo Gabor saying, is GH2A.X formed before the RAD51 filaments form? Uh, yeah, so gamma h 2 x is one of the classic markers of double strand breaks. So this is it's also actually uh, not just uh, restricted to double strand breaks, but uh, other damage uh, markers. So this is basically phosphorylated directly by either ATM or ATR kinases. So um, it almost certainly forms before um, the filament nucleation. Um, and, 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 and many people have shown over the years that actually gamma H2X actually spreads up to about a megabase uh, through a sequential mechanism of recruitment of those um, damaged induced kinases. Uh, so you get a huge, huge um, uh, spreading of gamma H2X. Um, and then of course, um, you then trigger the uh, processing of, of the double strand breaks and then you get RAV51 coming in. So if you do the time course, you see gamma H2X coming up before 51. Okay, uh, we have another question from somebody in, in Birmingham. Um, do you think the paralog mutants also prevent motor proteins disrupting the filaments? And have you tried adding any helicases into your assay? So yeah, um, a topical question. So um, this person is probably aware of the work from Wolf Heyer that was published in Nature in 2011, and they claimed that the paralog, and this was yeast, uh, Rafa 557, uh, could stabilize um, Rafa one filaments from the disruption by the uh, anti-recombinase SRS2. Uh, unfortunately, we think that was an artifact of um, poorly, uh, state, uh, poorly purified proteins. So um, 
uh, almost certainly what you see is, and we, we, we've seen this in fact, if you look at Derek Green's paper, which I referred to, um, he's directly tested this uh, in his system. So he shows that the power log complex that he is able to show is highly dynamic and um, is promoting stimulation of filament growth by the RAF51 uh, homolog in yeast is not disrupted by SRS2 at all. So, and, and that fits, right? How can something that is highly dynamic uh, in terms of its engagement with filament ends uh, antagonize the action of a motor protein? Um, so that I think unfortunately was an artifact of the system. Um, and um, as far as we can tell, and we've tested this as well in our system, we didn't publish it. The motor proteins do not, uh, are not uh, able to be uh, inhibited or preventing from fil preventing filament disruption by the power logs. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, somebody thanking you for a fantastic talk, um, and you mentioned that 500 nanomole of RAD51 um, is quite a lot, um, but do you know what the concentration is in vivo, or is there any estimate of that? Yeah, so Anton, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, the reason we used 500 nanomole RAF51 was just to illustrate how poor RAF51 is at nucleating on RPA-coated single-stranded DNA. Um, we use much lower concentrations for the dipping experiment where we're looking at the, uh, the highly dynamic or unstable nature of RAF51 nucleation uh, in the system. What's the concentration in vivo? Good question. It's certainly, uh, um, it, the, we certainly know, one thing we do know is that the power logs are um, present, expressed at much lower levels of RAF51 for, for the, you know, highlighting the fact that they act substoichiometrically as M binding, but precisely how much RAF51 is, uh, the concentration is in cells, it, it's not that clear. Um, but what we do know is that a number of cancers overexpress RAF51, and that actually can create more problems than good. So sorry, I don't have an answer to that. And finally, one more question. Um, yeah, yeah, you've got one. Thank okay, you for time for yeah, one yeah. more question um, from Marcus Hürfler. Uh, why do you think the human RAD51 power logs are much bigger than the C. elegans proteins and still perform the same function? So, um, so Marcus, so the, the, the power logs actually are similar size. So sorry, the confusion may be that it's BRCA2 that's bigger, right? Uh, the power logs are actually very similar in size between C. elegans and human. The complexity is that in C. elegans, you have two power logs that form a heterodimer. In humans, there are actually uh, five power logs that form two subcomplexes, the BCDX2 complex, four subunits, and the CX3 uh, uh, heterodimer. We still don't know why there are two different complexes in humans and, and what they exact what they're doing. And obviously BRCA2 is much bigger in humans. I think it's all to do with regulation. Um, there was a beautiful experiment from Maria Jason where she made a human version of the C. elegans protein. So she basically fused RPA, the, the OB fold of, of RPA, which is present in three copies in the human uh, BRCA2, is present uh, as a single copy in the C. elegans, to a single BRC repeat. So in C. elegans, there's one BRC that's is sufficient to bind RAF51. In humans, there are eight. And there's a huge amount of variability. Trypanosomes have 15 BRCs, but you only need one. We, why you have additional ones is not clear. Um, but there's clearly additional regulation in terms of phosphorylation and other factors that interact uh, in humans, and, and that's to be worked out. But the mini BRCA2 uh, it put into to a BRCA2 mutant in human cells can, to a large extent, restore most of recombination function. So why there's this additional complexity, we still need to work that out. Okay. Thank you for the question. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Simon. That's great.